talk a little bit about Harborview and its impact on the world around. We're going to start off, we do like our icons here at Harborview, and there's hardly anyone in the world more iconic than our next speaker, who's Mike Kopas. Mike is instrumental in getting the trauma system going here in Seattle. A lot of the younger, the residents and fellows don't remember a time before 911 on your phone. So with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce Mike Kopas, who's going to talk about the origins of the Medic One program. Mike. In the 1970s, uh, the country was, of course, in modest turmoil, and the original study in Seattle was to figure out whether or not you could make a difference. The other issue was the development of a portable battery-powered defibrillator, shown here, uh, a modest weight, now equal to a boat anchor, <laughs> uh, 33 pounds, and it gave the Dr. Kirby's, the future Dr. Kirby's of the world, the opportunity to repair more shoulders than he had time to do. <laughs> In this particular community, the fire department had been not in the first aid business until Chief Gordon Vickery decided that it should be only because they weren't doing anything, and Vickery was really interested in making the fire department in a public image. He built fire stations, bought fire engines, and eventually when Dr. Cobb went down and faced him and said, how would you like to put some of your guys to work taking care of something a little bit more sophisticated than a scraped knee, he acquiesced. And as a consequence, 10 people were eventually trained to do all kinds of what we call significant interventions, intubate, provide intracardiac, if you will, medications, do a variety of things that doctors shouldn't, couldn't, some couldn't do, and most obvious laymen shouldn't do. So the idea that a fire department would go into the business of providing acute care was an interesting concept, not seen and not particularly enjoyed by the old timers in the fire department. But it was a unique relationship between the University of Washington, the city of Seattle, and a former county-owned and now university-managed facility. It was a research project, and two questions were really asked. Can you save lives, and can non-physicians do it? Originally, the program was managed by two medics and a physician simply because there was no law that allowed them to work independently. The training program went from about 200 hours to now almost 3,000 hours. And the 3,000 hours are really devoted to street activity. The whole goal in this institution was to train hard, uh, simply because the day that you train, no matter whether you were a surgeon or whether you were an orthopedist or whether you were Arthur Ward's neurosurgery resident, was Super Bowl Sunday. And the idea was that the harder you train, the better you did. And so it was a simple thing to take the orthopedic activity, the neurosurgical activity, and the general surgery activity and translate that to the street. So the training is hard. It's essentially advanced infantry training in medicine, where in fact you're continually subjected to negative reinforcement so that you can be a better person, so that you can in fact... <laughs> learn how to think, when all about you have quit. Now if you take that particular attitude, and you take that particular mentality, and you put it in the street, and you put it in Seattle, you put it in King County, you put it in Bellevue, and you've trained those individuals in this particular institution, then in fact they want to bring people back here because they know that the institutions that they're dealing with around the community at that time were really not prepared to deal with them. Some of them had emergency rooms, some didn't. So in fact, as the hospitals developed, they also were the recipients of significant education or at least a training program that brought them sicker and sicker people. And that was true here. When I was an intern in Chicago, we saw no people like this because they all died in the street or waiting to get into Cook County. People were being brought to this particular facility that had no right to live simply because they were resuscitated in the field and the institution made an effort to respond to that. The general surgeons made an effort to respond, the ICU made an effort to respond, the Hudsons of the world, the Fleets of the world, the Hansons of the world, the Canizeros of the world, the Caracos of the world made an effort to bring the hospital not so much up to the medics but at least to keep ahead of them and I thought that was a fairly reasonable thing. So that what you saw was an institution being driven by more and more resuscitations in the field. And I think that actually um, is a subtle 
subtle point. When in fact, you could take an individual to an institution in some other part of the community and see them languish and bring an ins individual to this institution and see Hansen or Winquist, for that matter, walk into the year and say, let's go to the operating room right now, and in fact have that happen. It clearly tells an individual with a high school education there is a better way. There are some things that we contributed to the EMS community across the country, and the most important one was a layer, was being able to send a quick vehicle and a slower vehicle and an even slower or, in fact, longer, more, more distance, somewhat lower, slower in response vehicle, so that we had quick response to everything, no matter whether it was a major trauma, an individual in cardiac arrest, or a child who simply had an airway obstruction. But when you think about that particular activity, when you think about response and the intensity of training, and then you look at the Northwest, there are other things that you have to think about. The University of Washington functions as a medical school for 25% of the land mass of the United States. And 25% of the land mass of the United States has a variety of local prides and local ideas and local concepts, some of which are wonderful and some of which really need help. And I think to myself of almost four years in the United States Army, never had a privilege of working with anybody. I was always talking to myself. And when you look at the mirror and talk to yourself, you find yourself as really a not particularly good conversationalist. <laughs> And you would say, self, what are you going to do? And you would say, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I can remember one day I took care of a guy who inadvertently had fallen on a beer bottle, severed his forearm, cut every major muscle in his forearm, taking Grant's method and putting him back together piece by piece by looking at Grant's method. And I, just, I missed his median nerve. That's about as much as good as I did that guy. And I think to myself, when you're by yourself <clears throat> and you don't have anybody to talk to, it's nice to pick up the phone and say, can you help me? and have somebody say, hey, we'd love to, which is one of my mother's favorite phrases. In fact, that's the only thing I ever taught anybody in the ER that you need to master. When somebody asks you, may I, you say, I would just love to. <laughs> the airlift issue came about simply because of a fire. A bunch of kids were burned up. They were inadvertently playing in an old wooden house in the native section of Sitka, a beautiful old cedar home burned flat to the ground. Five children, three actually succumbed fairly quickly. We were trying to get them all to Seattle. Needless to say, they dropped like flies one by one. And finally, we had one left, and we started off for Seattle, and she died over the Dixon entrance. But it took from 2 o'clock in the afternoon until 3 o'clock in the morning to get an airplane to get her up there and get her out. So I thought to myself, why should a reasonably intelligent general surgeon have to spend essentially a whole day trying to find an aircraft to take a sick child to Seattle? And that, in fact, was the inception of Airlift Northwest. Now, remember up to that time, we were dependent on MASS, the 51st Med Detachment, who comes swooping up over the freeway, land just like they were landing a hot zone in Vietnam, and swoop back again. And that was air transportation. Now we have a reasonable program. We have a city program, which in fact is a county program, which in fact is a regional program, that brings critically injured individuals selected by, in the field because the knowledge of the medics is that they can be cared for well. They can literally walk out of this facility. We've extended that particular program to the region so that with a helicopter, <laughs> we could pick up anybody and bring them to Seattle and, in fact, see them and give them the benefit of what we might call a large teaching program. The idea that the concept was that individuals would be put through the same mill as the guy on the street, and if you were, in fact, stabbed in Sitka and stabbed at First and Pike, broke your leg in Sitka, broke your leg at First and Pike, your outcomes would be exactly the same. Transportation did not interfere with your outcome. We have one other concept that's very difficult to sell, and sometimes it's, it's impossible. And that is, every time we look at what we do in the Medic One program, or for Matt, that matter at Airlift, you say, can we improve? Can we make ourselves better people? And the answer is yes, somehow. And so we make little changes. And our constant little changes are really adjusting the cardiac arrest routine, but that makes the program better, because that's the single biggest definer of whether or not this is a reasonable city service. Can you in fact do what you say you do and can you do it even better day by day? So over the years we've studied things. We looked at individuals who jumped off the Aurora Bridge, the single biggest trauma generator of constancy that the world has. When you jump 151 feet, you hit the water and you hit the water. You almost always have the same injuries. In fact, can you get an individual out of the water intubated with two large bore IVs into Harborview in 14 minutes? If you can, you pass muster. Can that individual survive his bilateral pulmonary contusions, his bilateral pneumothoraces, his ruptured liver, cracked spleen, busted pelvis, and two busted femurs, which is on the average what he has? The answer is yes. So Emetic One, in fact, doubled the survival rate of individuals hitting the water. 
Obviously, we've studied the utility of CPR, we've studied drugs, we've looked at whether or not high energies are better than low energies. It turns out that high energies are more likely to cook hamburger, lower energies are more likely to leave you in ventricular fibrillation. We decided that everybody in the country should have salmon once a week. You don't go into ventricular fibrillation, and if you do, you're easier to resuscitate. That, in fact, you can teach people to do CPR over the phone if you teach them simply, and obviously now working on cooling after cardiac arrest. So the whole goal is to make yourself better. So the 80s for me were a time when we expanded Harborview's capability. We went from the Hansapedics of the 70s where we suddenly said there is a change coming and put the change into place. We met some of the logistic issues by simply overcoming them. We were entertained because suddenly the medical community in this particular city and this particular region accepted early care. We saw Harborview change. We saw Harborview meet the response of bringing sicker people to the facility. And the guys that did it are basically located in this room. It was the fellows, it was Dr. Hansen, it was all the people that have come since who are willing to take on the responsibility. And for this, speaking from the street, I'm eternally grateful. And for SIG, thank you very much. We've appreciated our time. We're going to have a little video highlight now. Uh, Bob Clausen did his internship here and then went off to serve his country and did his residency in Louisiana and came back, has been in private practice up the road. And a few years ago, he and Dick Foley decided that Harborview needed to be recognized in some kind of more permanent fashion and started to create a video documentary. Okay, Dick, come on up. I worked in uh, local television for about 16 years and I vacillated between uh, the roles of uh, interviewer and I'm happy to say that the most, some of the most memorable are with people in this room. Uh, and storyteller, and I think it's probably the storytelling part that uh, got me here today. Uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Clausen, is a very fine orthopedic surgeon who surprised me in 2007 with his enthusiasm and his vision about creating what we might call a real life version of uh, ER or uh, a Gray's Anatomy. And it was all set here in Seattle in the uh, 1960s and 70s, the medical community here uh, fostered a confluence of individuals and energies that resulted in an unusual and ultimately a highly productive alchemy. Uh, we had a mentor, a physician educator named D.K. Clausen, <coughs> who recognized first that change was coming, and second that some young surgeons uh, under his leadership had extraordinary skill and the courage to challenge the status quo. Uh, we had a developing medical school at the University of Washington that was uh, far enough geographically from the then centers of medicine in Boston, New York, Baltimore, uh, Cleveland, uh, that sometimes resistance to change could be overridden uh, in the name of progress. Uh, we had procedures, as you've heard today, in orthopedic surgery that were sometimes producing less than optimal outcomes for patients. Uh, many of our trauma interventions were falling short. That was changing. Uh, and we had a hospital, not called Harborview then, uh, that was perfectly positioned to change the rules that governed the delivery of both orthopedic and uh, trauma care. So taken all together, these were the elements for a very, very powerful story. And, and uh, Dr. Clausen saw it. And largely due to his enthusiasm, I came to see it as well. And uh, it's a story that is not widely known, but that's mostly simply because it hasn't been told very much until now. We're going to share with you this morning kind of the early fruits of our labors, uh, a little piece that we just called Harborview, The Trauma Story. Set apart in the far northwest corner of America, Seattle has garnered the reputation as a laboratory for innovation. The Puget Sound area is home to leading companies in many different industries. Boeing, Microsoft, Nordstrom, Costco, Starbucks, and Amazon.com come quickly to mind as enterprises whose products and services extend to a global market. Established in 1861, the University of Washington became home to one of the most progressive medical schools in the nation. It was at the university's teaching hospital, Harborview Medical Center, where some of the most profound changes in orthopedic medicine and trauma care were introduced during the 1970s. This represented dramatic change in the care of patients who were literally dying from their injuries, in most cases before they ever reached a hospital. 
Spearheading this change was a physician, teacher, mentor, and visionary named D.K. Clausen. Dr. Clausen knew change was needed to save patients' limbs and lives, and he set the stage with what now must be seen in historical context as a bold and remarkable master plan. His vision of immediate surgical stabilization of the severe skeletal injuries, coupled with rapid transport from Medic One and aggressive resuscitation in the emergency room, would prove to increase survival and enhance recovery for these multiply injured patients. Well, everything is incremental and it started really way back uh, for me in the 50s when I was a resident in San Francisco at uh, Stanford and San Francisco City County Hospital where we had a large number of hip fractures coming in. And uh, we were taking care of them, getting them put together so that you could operate on them and using a, a, a flanged nail, sharp nail that you could pound in to put the bones together, sometimes a plate, screws, things of that nature. And uh, the results to me were not good. We were losing a lot of patients. He was a real icon as far as I'm concerned uh, of orthopedic surgery and particularly academic uh, orthopedic surgery because he was all about trying to solve problems for the patient. You had some visionary people who were willing to take a chance. So Kay Clawson, I think, falls into that category, a visionary individual who was willing to take a chance. Dr. Clawson found other physicians who were disillusioned with the standard approach to treating hip fractures, including Mr. Ian McKenzie, who Clawson met while working in London. He had devised a screw, a self-tapping screw that he could put in and then he put a sleeve over it and a plate on so that it would slide and collapse and let the bones come tight together. With the typical British uh, way of doing things, he said, I, they will never allow me uh, to use this. This won't be part of the healthcare system. So if you can use it in America, here, take it. Clausen modified the self-tapping hip screw and came up with a blunt nose device that he felt could greatly improve and standardize the fixation of hip fractures. And the beauty of it was uh, not only did we have a technique that you could do exactly the same way, but we could stand the patient up the next day, have them put weight on it, impact it, get it secure, and uh, implement uh, you know, an early treatment program. Then, turning his attention to femur fractures, he was fortunate to meet a Professor Bühler in Austria who had adopted a technique developed by Dr. Kuncher in Germany. So they could nail the femur fractures with the Kuncher technique, which was uh, to make a little tiny incision in the hip and go in and poke a hole and ream it out with a big reamer and put a huge nail down that made it very, very uh, stable. And they would do that very shortly after they, they came to the trauma hospital. Intermedullary is inside the bone, so when you look at a bone, it's pretty hollow in the center. And so it, we found that with very small incisions that we could put a, a metal rod, almost like rebar, down the middle of a bone and fix it without exposing the whole fractures. So you wanted to be able to fix the patient and mobilize them, but you couldn't do big surgery, blood loss and infections and all those things. And so with small incisions and with an x-ray fluoro machine that was new then, we were able to see what we were doing and be able to fix these through very small incisions and get people up and get them going again. So it was very exciting, still yeah. is exciting. We were working towards the goal of getting patients cared for by trauma surgeons, people that de would devote themselves to a technique. And when a patient came in, would be available to care for them definitively right away. That was our goal. Uh, it is not easy to do because it takes a dedicated staff, it takes people that are willing to devote their lives to this type of, uh, of, of surgery, uh, and we were working in that direction. But that's an, another leg of the story because that did not happen and probably wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been again for a young resident by the name of Sigvard uh, T. Hansen who was a, a resident at the time that we started this, uh, taking a full-time position at Harborview immediately on finishing his training, and liked the technique, embraced the concepts, and as a full-time orthopedist at Harborview, he was there all the time. 
The thing that was interesting, or that got me interested in the trauma, was that I found out that I had a, a natural sort of ability to do three-dimensional things. So even as an intern, I would go down and do the hip fractures while they made the residents go to <laughs> the clinic. Ted Hansen is a farm boy from eastern Washington. Um, incredible three-dimensional ability and uh, just very strong in his convictions. The thing that we did that was actually more important than any of those things was that we realized that you, you needed to fix open fractures more even than closed fractures. My rationale was that a fracture that was severe enough and displaced enough to cause the skin and the muscles to break down or be injured that they needed more support. So we should immediately fix the skeleton. Well, before we did that, the idea was that that was too risky because you're putting a foreign body inside these soft tissues and infection will be a problem. But I thought it would be less if we fixed the skeleton because then the soft tissues are back to their normal length and their normal shape and the circulation is improved and so it should be more resistant to infection. There was something else happening at the same time and that was a Swiss group uh, that had visited here with, with me, devised a whole new system called the AO system, the Swiss AO system, of fixing fractures with different size, different types of screws, plates, a whole system of care. But while Hansen's convictions told him he was doing the right thing for patients, the orthopedic community as a whole, and especially in the eastern United States, were not so enthusiastic about these approaches. They weren't accepted at all. <laughs> they would come to our conferences and stand up and shout that we were doing malpractice. And um, most cases we did were considered malpractice then, which was a little difficult. I was, you know, pretty new and to have, I thought I was doing some really great work and to have people say that we're very respectable people that I was doing malpractice, that was a little hard to face because we were doing some things that were quite a bit different than what other people were doing. I was having trouble getting papers published, uh, uh, this type of thing, uh, early on uh, because it was such a departure. The community resisted it. Dr. Claussen made me the chief of the trauma service, but the point was that you, the reason it could be done is because with his prestige as a chairman and having been around, he backed it up and kept people from stopping us because there were people in town that wanted us to stop doing that. But a lot of people really will not do anything that they can't find a quote in the literature that says this is okay. So resistance to change in, in some cases is seen as resistance to improvement. <laughs> that's, that's um, of course it's true, isn't it? If you can't change, you can't improve. It was just this concept of doing all things in one hospital one way that didn't happen in America. That's not the way we were set up to do things. And we took our lead from Britain, where they thought everything could be treated in plaster casts and in traction. But plaster casts and traction were not to be the future of orthopedic trauma care. I wasn't thinking about the future. I was working uh, 18 hours a day. Uh, the future was uh, a little sleep at night. And uh, so at that time, we were taking care of a lot of people and, and uh, recognized that we were doing some great work because I knew how well the patients were doing, but I uh, wasn't looking at the future quite at that time. We learned a little later that it was pretty great and a lot of people accepted it. Now, you have to understand that this came at a time when everyone used the word conservative management of fractures to refer to non-operative management. So you have to decide for yourself, is it more conservative if you had a fracture like this to lie in bed for a long period of time or to be in a cast from literally your nipples to your ankles? Or would you rather have an operation that would enable you to be up and out of bed the next day walking around? It changed so quickly here because Clausen had the vision and Hansen was brave enough and good enough. He was so good that he could do this uh, and it would work out well, whereas other people might stumble with it more. So I, I think between the two of those, that's what sort of set it off. That's correct. It's exactly what it demanded. Uh, sicker and sicker patients were able to survive their acute injury to make it to the hospital. And as you say, with those uh, injuries, it required a well-developed system of working the patient up. And 
you know, parochially, what was nice was the general surgeon was always recognized as the captain of the ship. What this started was the concept of a trauma center. And as you know, Harborview Medical Center is one of the first, and I would argue still the best trauma center in the United States and perhaps in the world. It's what we call a level one trauma center, which means that that's where the really bad stuff goes. And now it exists as a resource for much of the country. Medic One originated in Seattle and 911 originated in Seattle. Uh, Leonard Cobb was first and then Mike Kopas did most of the work. And all of a sudden, we had to face problems we had never seen before because these were people that were all dying at the injury site. And now they're alive and they're coming in and the injuries were just much greater and it wasn't single injuries, it was multiple injuries. And it was the first city in the, in the country that developed this fire department based pre-hospital trained personnel that would respond to the injury, initiate care, and deliver to a single center that's dedicated to trauma. But a majority of the concept of putting people back together are people who come off a farm, out of a major automobile accident, 25 year old mother of three, it's people who are your neighbors, who inadvertently get injured unexpectedly. Right. As is often said, trauma is the great equalizer. At the moment, the SUV hits you in a crosswalk, it doesn't matter if you're the poorest or the wealthiest person in the world, you're hurt and you need to go someplace where they know how to, how to do it. What is really important is that um, the patients have access to that kind of uh, facility. Because trauma patients don't have a lobby. They, nobody thinks they're ever going to be a trauma patient. You're never planning on being in Harborview's emergency room at midnight on Saturday. I give this sort of standard lecture on ICU care around the world now, literally, and uh, we're always trying to identify things that we've done that have had a major impact on outcome for the injured patient in the ICU. And, and I always give credit at the end to probably the one thing that we truly can identify that had a major impact on survival after, after severe injury was the change in orthopedic care. When I did my trauma fellowship, there were really only two trauma fellowships in the country. I had a sense of great optimism for the institution. I could, I, you could sense there that there was a, a, a history and a community of innovation. I'm most proud of all the people that uh, have trained here that I've got um, people in almost every country around the world. If I go in a faculty, it can be in Hong Kong or Singapore or Australia or New Zealand or um, the major people there will be people that train at Harborview. Well, it's in many ways our crown jewel. It's, um, it's the thing that defines our department and our training program. It's a classic Seattle story. One wonders if it would have happened anywhere else.